Today we have another multiple part episode brought to you by a very interesting individual and a very interesting interview. This interview from Howard Berg will cover many of the topics covered in some of his other materials and audiobooks from many years ago. However, the interview went on for so long and had so much useful information that we had to break it up into several parts. Even then, we're not able to get down all of the information covered in the interview. If the full interview is something that you might be interested in, let us know and maybe we'll post it online for full access. Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. On today's episode, we have Howard Berg, the Guinness Book World Record Holder for Speed Reading, also the creator of hbspeedreading.com and Speed Reading Secrets, as well as many other materials for your speed reading needs. Mr. Berg, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. I am interested in some of the topics we're going to cover today. I know I'm very interested in them. I know the audience is going to be because who could benefit more from speed reading than medical students that have huge, massive textbooks to go through in a very short amount of time? Well, I was telling you before we started, I was a biology major. I went to the State University of New York Binghamton when I was 17. And in my junior year, I got interested in the brain and how it works. So I went to the dean. I said, I want to do two majors, bio and psych. He said, you're a junior. And I was in my second term. You haven't had one psych course. You have to do a four-year program in one year and finish the bio curriculum. And I had three part-time jobs. And he said, frankly, you're not smart enough. And that's when it hit me. They don't teach learning in school. They tell you what to learn and why to learn, what will happen when you don't learn, but not why you remember the words to a song. You have to hear it once. And then you read the seven habits of highly effective people, and the next day you don't know any of the habits. So I used what I learned about the brain. I got up to 80 pages a minute, did the four-year program in one year, took the GRE in biology, very similar material to what you guys have to know, genetics, cell physiology, biochemistry. I got three questions wrong. I got an 800 on the GRE, which put me in the 99th percentile in the world, which is why I'm excited to share this with medical students because I developed this for precisely the type of material they're trying to learn. Perfect. And if I'm not mistaken, you spent a lot of time during your childhood, especially in the library and studying. And is that where you developed some of your speed reading techniques that we're going to cover today? I grew up in Brooklyn in, in the projects where there were a lot of gangs. The only place that they didn't go was the library. Gang kids would rather be dead than caught in the library. So I was reading the theory of relativity when I was eight. I had college reading when I was 11. So that was my hobby, and that was what I did. My mom would say, go out and play, and I'd look at her like, are you out of your mind? Do you have any idea where we live? I, mean, I was mugged over 100 times. I had knives to my throat. I was beaten with bats. My dad was pistol whipped. Reading was safe. Maybe you get a a, a, a paper cut, but it was a lot less dangerous than going outside with the crazy people where I grew up. I can't even imagine what that was like growing up, but it sounds like having a safe haven was not only safe, but very educational and transformational to what you've now become and what you've accomplished. Often in life, the things that start off as our, as our drawbacks, our problems, develop us into who we are as adults and having read over 30,000 books at this point. Uh, even if I was an idiot, I'd say I'm well-informed. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for the, for the problems I had because they, they made me have to follow a different path that helped me develop my mind. And now my focus is on helping others. Me doing it's like a sideshow. Watching someone swing from their teeth in Cirque du Soleil doesn't make you want to go home and try it. But when I have 11 year olds doing college courses in a week and getting A's, that's a breakthrough. And this is something every person studying medicine absolutely needs. And we'll be sharing some very specific things they can do during this podcast. Very good. Very good. So there is some controversy behind speed reading. I know when I first started reading about it about a year ago, I found just as many scientific articles saying that it's not possible. Your eyes can't read that fast. They can't move that fast. It doesn't get transferred to your brain fast enough. What is it that they're missing or are they partially right? Are they, what, where's the controversy coming from? The way speed reading was taught 
and still is, and I don't do it that way, is it's mechanical. So you're conditioning a response and you go quicker and quicker. Your brain gets comfortable and you're able to make out what you're reading, but you don't remember it. And if you don't understand it and you slow down and learn it, you lose your speed. And that's why people hated it. I, I didn't take that approach. Remember, I studied psychobiology and I took graduate courses in reading. What I did is I use reading to find what I need to need, need to know, and I have a system for determining that. I find what I don't know and need to learn, and then I use brain-based learning strategies to analyze what I didn't understand to make it meaningful. I use memory strategies to lock it in so I don't forget it in five minutes. And I use emotional intelligence strategies to stay in the state. So if you're taking an exam and you take a lot of them in medical school, if you get nervous, it's going to affect your performance. We did a double blind efficacy study using the Nelson Denny, which is a standardized test, but not just speed, but comprehension. We took 100 random people. 50 did the A and the B test. 50 did the B and the A to make sure the second test wasn't simpler and artificially inflated, inflated the results. Everyone in the study doubled or quadrupled in four hours with no loss of comprehension. So I can confidently say we've done a scientific study that proved that this program, using the strategies I described, actually works. Wow. I'd love a copy or a link to that so I can add it to the show notes when we're done too. I wasn't aware of that. I could do that. I can give you the whole study. So I know... <laughs> For me, it wasn't that hard to increase my speed because my reading was so horrific most of my life until about a year ago that when I'd see ads about increase your reading speed by 300%, I'm like, there's no way. It actually happened, but it's not that hard when you're only reading 150 words a minute. I forgot, what is your current speed reading? Well, it's about 80 pages a minute. Um, if, if you go to watchhowwoodread.com, it's me on Cavuto. I read the healthcare bill in 15 minutes. It was the, a 1,500-page bill and did a complete analysis. And then the second bill, which was the house bill, was 2,000 pages. That took uh, 58 minutes. And the last one was the combined bill, House and Senate, and that was 2,600 pages. took 90 minutes. And I just finished reading the Brexit Treaty for a company I'm working with in England. I did 10 videos on the 550-page treaty. No one knows what's in it. So I did a breakdown on how it would work. And this is the kind of thing you need to do when you're reading very thick books on anatomy and physiology. You have a tremendous amount of data to learn in a very short time and pretty much have to remember it the rest of your life. So it's not just a, a luxury to read quickly in your field. It's, it's an imperative. In fact, even after you become a licensed physician, you're going to have to take courses. For well, that time, you spend learning new strategies, taking your courses to keep your license. You don't get paid for that. That's time you can't spend with your family or relaxing or with your patients, but it's unavoidable. If you can cut that time in half or more and actually know what you need to know when you need to know it, it it's a double win. It increases your productivity, gives you more time for what matters. I'd love to get into some of your courses and audiobooks and and trainings. But before we go to there, what do you think is a reasonable rate for most people just learning to be able to develop within a couple of weeks to a couple of months? For instance, I think I went from only 150 words per minute to maybe four to 600 words per minute, depending on the material, which is nothing close to what you and a lot of other speed reading teachers are claiming out there. But for me, that's four, three, four times better than what I was doing. So I'm happy. I'm content with that. What would be reasonable for most students? Well, I actually know the numbers. The um, average reading speed, the mode, is 200 words per minute. The range of normal reading is 150 to 400 words a minute. Um, I tell people to be confident they'll double. We've had people go much higher. I'd rather under-promise and over-deliver than over-promise and under-deliver. But in four hours, it just takes four hours, you will be 100% faster with very good comprehension and learning skills. I'm much more interested in the 
retention and the understanding than the speed. It just turns out you can do both at the same time. And as we continue tonight, I'll show you exactly how that's possible and get people started so they could actually experience it. Great. Definitely, definitely want to cover that. The comprehension aspect is obviously the most important aspect of reading, especially when it has to do with scientific and medical text. So that will be vital. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know you have a few audiobooks uh, that can be found on Amazon and other resources. I've listened to some of those. I believe you do have some online trainings that are a little more recent. Yes, yeah, much more updated. HB speedreading.com, hbspeedreading.com. And there's reading, writing, memory, math. There's a bundle with everything. And there's even a bundle where I'll personally mentor them and give them private instruction if they need it. Great. Anything you can help uh, with the medical community and, and the student community in general is very appreciated. You want to find out how to read faster and then how to improve comprehension to get started? Let's do it. I have to interject here. The next few minutes of this episode will be hands-on training. If you are able, grab a book or a magazine or something next to you. If you're driving or otherwise incapacitated, don't worry about it. You can always do this part later on. Just listen to the technique and practice on your own time. Okay. What I'd like our listeners to do is find the book you've read, one you understood. We want to make sure the only thing that could interfere with your comprehension is your speed, not the complexity of the material. So if it's a book you'd read slowly and not understand, you're not going to know if you're confused because of the book or because of your speed. So pick a familiar text. Read for one minute the way you normally do and, at the, and time yourself. At the end of the minute, put a little line in the margin when you're finished. And that'll be in the first chapter. Now you have a measurement of how far you can go in a minute. Now go to the second chapter. I want you to go one line at a time using your left hand, going from the left to the right margin, one line at a time with your eyes following your hand. And here's the thing, as fast as you can comprehend. As long as you know what you're reading, go quicker till you don't, so you discover where your ceiling is. And then slow down just enough that your comprehension comes back. And for five minutes, go with your hand one line at a time across the page, completely across reading at your peak comprehension rate. Then go back to the first chapter where you initially tested yourself and do it a second time for a minute, but this time with your hand. And you're going to be amazed. You'll go about 20 to 40% further just doing that one single change. And, and after I teach this, I'll, I'll explain comprehension if you'd like. Yes. Uh, comprehension obviously is going to be very important for us. So if you would like to delve into some of the basics of comprehension techniques and how that differs or how they're used in conjunction with the speed reading techniques. Absolutely. Most people would agree comprehension is more important. than speed. I was with Dick, Dick Cavett. He was a very famous TV host in the 70s. He and I got to be friends. He was on MSNBC when it launched. He told me a funny story about he was interviewing Woody Allen and he read War and Peace in five minutes. It's a huge book. He said, that's incredible what he remembered. And Woody said, it's about the Russian Revolution. That's all I remember. And that's pretty much how speed reading worked. The secret to reading fast is in a word, it's called schema. Schema is what you know before you begin to learn. It's why you could read a medical book more easily than a novice because the words, the, the science that's there, you've gotten acclimated to it and you become accustomed to seeing certain terms that other people would not even be able to pronounce. Let me give you a passage that has no schema and watch how confusing it is, although the words are simple. Then I'll do it a second time with a title and watch how instantly the same text becomes effortlessly understood. This is the schemaless text. This is an easy thing to do. If possible, you could do it at home, but you could always go someplace else if it's necessary. Beware of overdoing it. This is a major mistake. It may cost you quite a bit of money. If I asked you right now, what am I talking about? What would you say? Talking about schema. <laughs> You don't, you don't know what the words mean. The words weren't difficult, but the meaning was cryptic. Now listen again, same text with a title that has schema and watch the difference in your comprehension. Laundry, this is a simple thing to do. If possible, you could do it at home, but you could always go someplace else if it's necessary. Beware of overdoing it. This could be a major mistake and expensive as well. 
suddenly the text makes total sense. So we're training people on how to find the schema. It's like the decoder ring. It makes the text on the page make sense to your brain. When you know how to find it two, three, four times quicker, you're not only reading faster, you're actually boosting your understanding because you're using the brain's natural strategy for making sense out of text. It's pretty simple. If, you, if you're driving in a car, you're processing data in four directions, front, back, left, and right. At about 80 miles an hour, 70, 80 miles an hour on a highway. And at the same time, you're watching your gauges, watching your GPS, and you're bored. You turn on the radio, you talk on the phone, and you talk to people in the car. You're still bored. You read a book about 200 words a minute and remember 10% the next day. Why? The difference is in a car, everything is processed very visually like a movie. In a book, it's like someone is in the back of your head pronouncing one word at a time, which is why most people read about 200 words a minute, is that's about how fast they speak. And so reading is using your eyes to hear a book, which is not an efficient use of your senses. Vision is analog. You take everything in instantly. Hearing is digital. You hear one sound bite at a time. By learning to make reading more of a visual process and a little less of a digital, a normal person could double and triple in just four hours' time with excellent comprehension. And that's kind of a good insight to how this would work. Now, I've heard of your schema technique in other materials, um, in some of your past materials, and it sounds very similar to another term that I hear very often, the SQ3R system. Are those basically equivalent in many ways? Are there differences? SR2Q stands for skim, read, review, question. When you're actually learning, not just trying to go quicker, first they skim, and say in a medical book, 10 minutes. I'm not trying to learn the book. I'm trying to learn the layout of the book. Are there texts? Are there glossaries? Are there tables? Are there charts? Are there sidebars? Are there questions? What did the writer do to make some information appear more important than others so I know what to look for? Then I read, looking for what I don't know, not what I do know, what I don't know and need to learn. And I teach people how to anticipate what the teachers and instructors will want them to know. Now I know what I'm looking for, or I look for it. When I find it, I switch to a memory skill to learn it. If I don't understand it, and that happens in some technical books, I use brain-based learning strategies to analyze it. So now you're able to learn highly technical material like genetics, biochemistry, organic chemistry, all things I took, Krebs cycle, and the Meyerhoff cycle. I mean, these things make sense to you and the people listening, but if a, no, a normal person was listening, they have no idea what we're talking about right now. You overestimate my knowledge and understanding of those concepts. Then. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, 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 it's, I thought in medical school they would cover that pretty no, well. They, but they do, but it's just so complicated. <laughs> it, it is. It is. But the beauty of it is things that seem complicated now become easier when you have better learning strategies. I'll give you a, a good um, exercise or show you how your brain can learn quicker. Now, you know when you go to the mall around holiday time, there's lots of people. You don't walk around and say, I don't know them, I don't know them. Then you see someone you know and you say hello. To see the person you know, you had to see thousands of other faces. You, you know the reticular activating system. When you see something that's significant to you, meaningful to you, it focuses your attention on it. It filters out the superfluous data, meaningless people. You see your friend, your neighbor, a relative, uh, a girlfriend, someone that matters to a teacher, and you spot them in the crowd. Here's a good exercise to show you how that would work in reading. Look around you at everything in your room colored blue and memorize it. Take a mental image, a picture of all the blue things that are around you. And I'd like a listener to do this too. Now close your eyes, close your eyes, and I want you to picture everything you looked at that was colored red. You can open your eyes. And your brain said, wait a minute, you said blue, and what happened? Blue things got bigger, brighter, and louder, and something else happened. Red and everything that was irrelevant got further away, dimmer, and lower. 
When you read with a purpose, the things that are actually relevant and significant will pop just like the color blue did because that's what your brain is focused upon. And your brain is designed to filter what's relevant from what's irrelevant in your environment. So it actually makes it very easy to find at very high speeds materials that are very critical to what you need to know as, as a medical student. Gotcha. So uh, I think there might be, I don't know if it's an updated or just a different person wrote SQ3R from what I've seen too. There might be both of them is from uh, what my notes say anyway. So hopefully I didn't write them wrong. It's survey, question, read, recite, review. So one specific part of speed reading, at least uh, from my understanding of it, and the thing that seemed to be slowing me down so much for both the speed and comprehension was my sub vocalization, which I didn't even know that was a thing before starting to read about speed reading. And then I asked friends afterwards, hey, I changed this and now I read a lot faster. He's like, oh, you were reading that way your whole life? No wonder you sucked at reading. So are there specific techniques that you can recommend for getting rid of the sub vocalization or maybe explain what that is first to the audience? Well, sub-vocalization, when we learn to read, many of us learn to read by reading aloud. Remember, when writing was invented, before recording and electronics, it was a way to preserve the sound of spoken language through pictures and symbols that represented the sound. And so people would read aloud what they saw because they were converting the symbols back to spoken language. And that's how most people read. So in order to make meaning out of it, it's not unusual for people to move their lips and talk at the same time as they're reading. And that limits you to reading at your speech rate. I mean, when I'm reading 80 pages a minute, I'm reading, it sounds more like a fax machine than, than words because it's, it's faster than you can hear. So there were a few things you could do. One, when you're using the hand strategies that I teach, the subvocalization stops because you can't vocalize at that speed. And second, one of the things I was taught in graduate school to eliminate it, which I don't do, I like the hand motions better, you could put a pencil or a pen in between your lips and it kind of inhibits your ability to mumble as you're reading. I personally don't do that, but I've seen that as an alternative strategy. I teach my people how to read fast well enough that they don't need to sub-vocalize and they actually do understand. Because I'm focusing more on psychology than just mechanics. Most programs are strictly mechanics. I'm much more interested in, in using the psychobiology I studied on learning and how the brain actually absorbs and uses data than on just going quicker. And that helps a lot in getting rid of the sub-vocalization. Okay, so your training probably wouldn't be as much about the pacer such as your finger finger techniques when reading. I've seen a lot of different materials that concentrate on how many yeah, lines you skip back and forth down. To I do that, but I don't make that the bulk of what I do. Okay. I, I think it's, it. I don't eliminate what works, but if that's all you're using, you're going to lose your speed very quickly in a medical book when you slow down and learn a new term mm -hmm. or a name because it's mechanical. You have to use it all the time, the speed learning. Much more important. Medical students do not want to speed read, but I'll show them how to speed learn if you'd like. Yes, I think all medical students and students in general would love to know how to speed learn. Great. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't think you'll know the answer, but I'm going to ask you and then I'll give you the answer. You're probably correct. There, there are only five things you need to learn to master any medical book. Do you know what those five things are? Because that's the key to learning fast. Um, <laughs> Okay, if you know. <laughs> okay, I just I, I just wanted to show where you are now. Okay, five things. The first thing is new words, vocabulary. As you know, there are a lot of very complex words in medicine. Most of them are Greek, and you begin to become familiar with the the patterns of like itis is inflammation. Doesn't matter what you put in front of it, whatever it is, it's inflamed, and you begin to learn your your, your Greek that way as you as you're using those words. So vocabulary, the first thing you need to learn, 80% of learning anything is learning the new words. It's a language. Medicine is a language. Second, the people, what did they do and why are they recognized? What did, who's in your book? Why are they there and what did they do? Like Crick, Watson and Crick, or Fleming. These are very important people in medicine. Third, 
any number date statistical formula, and there's a lot of those in medicine. Fourth, and in your textbook, there's probably a lot of headings and subheadings to separate thematic areas of the text and chapter. What are the five main points in each section of your text? And lastly, most of your books probably have questions. If they don't have questions, you need to create your own. What are all the questions and answers? So now we have the words, the names, the numbers, date, statistics, the formula, the five takeaways, and the answers to every question. You know every word and what it means. Every person and what they did. The five main points in every section. The answers to every question. What else do you need to know? And the answer is nothing. That's, and I'll show you how to learn a course now in one-fifth the time in medical school. Would that be helpful? That would bring two years of basic science down to a few months. I think that would be very helpful. Normally, when you do group work, and I know it's not uncommon for study groups to form in a medical environment because of the complexity, you kind of feed off of each other. And so you'd say, I'll read chapter one, you read chapter two, so-and-so reads three, another one four, and somebody doesn't do their work. And you end up doing a lot and you don't get much back. So we don't do that. My school, what we did, person in the group in the first chapter learns all the words. The second person learns all the names and what they did. And you put these in a table, you know, the word and the meaning, the person and what they did. The third person, the numbers, dates, statistics, and formula. The fourth person looks for the five main ideas in each section. And the fifth person looks for every question and finds the answer. Now you rotate. In the second chapter, the person who started with words does the names. The person who did names does the math. The person who did math does the main ideas. The person who does the main ideas does the um, questions. The person who did questions does the vocabulary. If you're taking one slice and you're creating a master table, so we did this with 18 young people. We gave them a 30-chapter book in lifelong developmental psych, which is a medical-oriented subject. They were 11 to 15 years old. The, the book was 30 chapters. They did it in one week by doing it in groups of five. And in one week, they took the CLEP, which is an advanced placement exam. 15 out of 18 students passed college, lifelong developmental site at 11 to 15 years old in one week. If you use this in your medical programs, you'll fly through your material. But you want to create tables. So... You have a master table. The first column is the word. The second column is the meaning. The first column is the name of a scientist or doctor. The second column is what they did. The first column is the number, date, statistical formula. The second column is how to use it or its significance. The fourth thing would be the main point, five main points for a section, and the last thing, question, answer, question, answer. And so they can fill in those charts and five people now, uh, you get five chapters work done for the effort of one because you're only doing one slice. You're leveraging the intelligence of your group. Do you remember to stay tuned for the next part of this episode? We'll go into greater depth about different testing and memory techniques. Also, leave a comment about anything you think we can do to improve on the show or things you would like covered in future episodes. We'd love to hear your input on these. 